Hello, I'm Roger Casale and I'm a European, a British European. I was born in Europe. I was born in Europe, I have Italian ancestors, but I don't think we should restrict European identity to people who are born here. We should open European identity to others from outside who want to come here. My friend Maria from Bulgaria, when she, her country joined, she said, I identify with Europe because Europe is where to go when your home state turns rogue. And many, we know that many migrants and refugees want to see in Europe a refuge, and, and we, should, we should see Europe in that way too. The French historian Carl Renan talked about nations in the 19th century as a, what he called a plebiscite de tous les jours. I call that the referendum view of Europe, a matter of daily choice. But actually for me, what Europe is, is a place uh, that guarantees my rights. We only need to look at the anxiety and the uncertainty of the millions of people whose lives have direct, uh, been disrupted by what has happened with the vote to leave the European Union. One of them, my friend who's French, Samir, said to me, take away our rights and you take away our identity. So for me, European identity means the rights that I have as a European citizen. But if I am from Europe, is there really a place called Europe? Is there such a place with that name? Bismarck, in the end of the 19th century, said that Europe was a geographic expression. I think he would have uh, got on well if he was alive today with Norman Steele, the man from Huddersfield, who reportedly before the referendum was said, he was voting leave, was said to have not only not, have been, not, only not to have ever been out of Britain, but to have never been out of Huddersfield. But you don't need to go out of Huddersfield or anywhere else to understand that where we live today in Europe is not the same place as it was at the end of the 19th century. After the devastation of the wars, Europe was recreated. We did create a place called Europe. We have created a place called Europe. I call it Europe 1, Europe 2, Europe 3. Europe of the states, the Union of the States, Europe 1. Europe of the markets, Europe 2. And what we have today, which I would call Europe of the citizens, or at least not just me, Angela Merkel, the leading statesman of today, a Europe of the citizens, Europe 3. But what exactly is this European identity of which we speak? Is there a kind of multicolour coat that we can put on that makes us European? I remember when the British had the presidency of the European Union, they produced a tie. They tried to capture the idea of European identity with the pizza for Italy and the sausage for, for Germany and uh, baguette for France. But European identity doesn't work like that. Remember the story of the emperor's new clothes. Remember, you, were, if you, were, you could only see it in, uh, if you were clever enough or fit for office. We talk too much about Europe in these terms today, and we shouldn't do, we should avoid that. Uh, it's almost as if the invisible cloak of the emperor has got the words stronger together, embroidered on the back. Europe identity doesn't work like that. In Europe, you can wear whatever you like. You can be whatever you like. That's the point about Europe. Europe, we have rights. We are free. We, Europe allows us to express who we really are. And so if, it's, um, if we look at Europe today, or if we look at Europe through history, um, what do we see? Auden, writing on the eve of the Second World War, from, as he described it, one of those dives in 52nd Street in New York, Look back at Europe, at the old continent, and he wrote, defenseless under the night, our world in stupor lies, but dotted everywhere, ironic points of light. We are those ironic points of light. We, the Europeans, we, the citizens. But pretty soon after Auden wrote, the lights went out in Europe. And it's, uh, it's very difficult to think about how you can uh, recreate something from nothing. H how you can define yourself against something that we are not. My American friends, Alan, my American friends, sometimes talks about Europe. He says, Europe is not America. But Europe is not America, that is true. Europe is not China, it's not India. Many people say we understand what Europe is when we come into Europe from outside and we see it as a whole. But can we as Europeans really define ourselves in terms of something that we are not. Can anybody, can any human being define themselves in terms of something they are not? 
Well, John Donne, the Elizabethan poet, thought you could do that. In fact, he wrote in his poem, A Nocturne on St. Lucy's Day, that he had created a quintessence from nothingness. He was traumatized by the death of his lover. And he said, and I am re-begot of darkness, death, things that are not. It's a metaphor for the reconstruction of Europe after the Second World War. What we see here is not a geographical expression, Europe. We see Europe, which the historian Keith Lowe described uh, as being in 1945, a savage continent of devastation. Darkness, death, things that are not. I'm showing you a picture of Dresden. I could have picked the Holocaust or anything else because Dresden, we, we bombed Dresden. This is what you have to do in the end, it seemed, to put an end to the psychopathic destruction that we saw at the end of these, uh, 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 that led to the Second World War and the Holocaust and Nazism and the occupation. And when people, when this, those people that survived the war came in, in Europe, thought about where to go next, they couldn't go back to their own countries because their own countries didn't exist anymore. So they had to go towards a new country. And the name of that new country was Europe. And Hannah Arendt, the political theorist, talked about Europe and European integration as the pardon and the promise of the post-war years. And Albert Camus talked about a country of the spirit Europe is a country of the spirit, a place of social justice and equality anchored in human rights. And we have more grandiose visions. We had Churchill's idea of Europe as a union of states, a United States of Europe, although it was never clear whether Britain was supposed to be part of it. And we had de Gaulle talking about the Europe of nation states, from the Atlantic to the, or to the Urals. But actually, the way that Europe was rebuilt that re-begot itself after the Second World War was not through these grandiose visions, so much as through the day-to-day -day experience of men, and they were mainly men, from the borderlands of Europe, from those regions like South Tyrol, Alsace-Lorraine, Flanders, that had been divided and destroyed by being one community and yet divided by national borders. Men like de Gasperi from South Tyrol, who became the Prime Minister of, of Italy after the war. Men like Henry, uh, Paul Henry Spark from Flanders, the, the Belgian Prime Minister, and the architect of European integration, Robert Schumann, the French Foreign Minister from Alsace-Lorraine. And they understood three things. First of all, they understood that if they were going to create this new country called Europe, it had, borders had to be a thing of the past. And they also understood that if we were going to get on and work together and prosper and survive, we needed to embrace each other as neighbors. We needed to make love, not war. And they understood also that you could have multiple identities. You could be from Alsace-Lorraine and from France, and you could be European too. It wasn't that one replaced the other. And they understood that European identity was a gift it was something that was an added value, something that was of existential importance to them and their families and to the future of Europe, and they built on that. And out of this understanding, out of this culture, out of this new sense of European identity in Europe one, came the post-war institutions of Europe, starting with the European coal and steel community. And Anna Arendt, who was not known for waxing lyrical about things, who was a preeminent critic of totalitarian regimes, did write lyrically did fall in love with the European coal and steel community. We don't fall in love with the single market, but Europe, one, was something that was existential that was key to Europe's identity. And Europe, however, was still unite, disunited until 1989. And this is my Europe, too. And I lived in Berlin in 1989, and what a joy it was to be alive. And if we look... <laughs> at the people, in fact, if we close our eyes and think about the people in this slide and try to hear what they were saying to us. What they were saying, the message they were saying to us were, was, wir sind das Volk, we are the people, we are the citizens, we are the ironic gods of light. And because I lived in Berlin, I, I know that the Berlin Wall didn't fall down, it was pushed. It was pushed by 
as a result of movements like solidarity and civic renewal and the amazing potential of civic society that actually stood up and spoke out and changed the world for good. But soon after Berlin, the Berlin War, we, the darkness returns to Europe. You have the massacre of Srebrenica. You have terrible things still happening. So just because you're on to a new phase of history doesn't mean to say that the old battles don't need to be fought again. They do. But we did create a different kind of Europe, the Europe that we live in today. The single market gave fantastic opportunity, but it also brought a lot of pain, a lot of injustice, a lot of inequality, particularly uh, elephant today. So although we get to a Europe today, which I refer to as a Europe of the citizens, or which you might think of, my friend the geographer, human geographer Demetrius Ballas calls it a continent united in diversity. There are many cracks appearing. Um, Europe won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012, rightly so, in my view, because it is the existential basis for peace in Europe. But in many ways it has found itself on the wrong side of the argument about globalization. We only need to think about the, the cracks that are there today, the cracks that we see, not just in terms of the economic and the social injustices in Europe, but also politically. Do we want to have a Europe in which states like Poland do not respect the rule of law? Is that something that we can tolerate in a Europe of the citizens? Do we want to have uh, a Europe in which journalists like Kim Kuczak and his fiance who were killed in Slovakia two weeks ago are murdered and the, 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 the people who kill them are, uh, are not brought to justice, are not punished, or, or Daphne Galizia in Malta? Is that the kind of Europe that we want to call a Europe of the citizens today? Or a Europe in which the European Parliament is still very, very weak? So I think that there are a number of cracks that we can see in, in the Europe 2 that we have created, or the Europe 3, if you like, the Europe of the citizens that need to be addressed. And I would even go as far as to say that we are at a moment in 2018 akin to the moment that we were in in Europe in 1945 and again in 1989. A moment where Europe faces a choice an existential choice about the way forward. Do we go forward together to the new Europe, or do we risk falling into the past? The key questions for us will be how we respond to migration. Do we see migration into Europe as an opportunity, which I believe it is, potentially a new Marshall Plan for Europe, something that can not just renew our economy and our society, our falling, deal with, help deal with our falling competitiveness, but also renew the European soul. We have an aging population and we have falling competitiveness and Europe needs migration. Or are we going to close our hearts, close the doors and see migration as a threat? Are we going to share the economic fruits of European integration? What about a European pension pay for as a dividend from the growth uh, that is supposed the growth dividend that is supposed to come from more integrated markets. Perhaps that's something that would be attractive to Norman Steele in Huddersfield and help him also to identify with Europe. Or are we going to fall back to the past? To the black shirts, to the brown shirts, to the nationalists who are on the rise? The answer to that question lies in our hands. Hans Christian Andersen, apparently, in the story The Emperor's New Clothes, added as an afterthought the child in the crowd who cried out, the Emperor's got no clothes. It was a cry that changed things. It's a, it's a cry of speaking truth to power. It is a cry that changes the narrative. We, must, we, the citizens of Europe, you and I, we must find the power to say this again. Very often the old European institutions don't like hearing people who are critical of them. They think that you have to accept it as it is today. 
they think that they're wearing the emperor's new clothes, and if you can't see how good it is, then there must be something wrong with you. But there are things that need to be changed, big things that need to be changed, and we must look to the citizens of Europe to do it. But we have created European citizens. We have created Europe. Europe is a place. Europe has citizens. We are citizens. We are still citizens of Europe. We have our rights, our rights to free movement, our rights to speak out. We have a voice, and we must use it. And in the 19th century in Italy, Massimo D'Azeglio, who was an Italian senator, said, We've cre after Italian unification, we have created Italy, now we have to create the Ita now we have to make Italians. And I would say in Europe today, it's the other way around. Europe is a place. We, had to, we, we need Europe. Europe is not going away. The European Union is not going away. I don't believe that even if Marine Le Pen was president of France, that she would want France to leave the European Union. She might want to leave the, European, the, the Euro, but she won't leave the European Union because that identity that we have as Europeans that is founded on peace is absolutely key to our survival. But it's not good enough in Europe today just to say we have peace, which we do, and which is valuable, and we have the single market. Something else is needed as well. And to find that something else, we need to look at ourselves. We need to remember who we are. And who we are as citizens, whether we like it or not, as citizens of Europe, with rights and with a voice. And what, m and, and what underpins that are our values, the values of the Enlightenment, of liberty, equality, and solidarity. And so it's up to us now. We are not responsible as citizens of Europe for what has happened in the past, but we do have a responsibility for what happens in the future. And like the child in the picture, we must find our voice, we must change the narrative, we must take responsibility for what happens next. We are Europeans, and w now it is time to create the new Europe. So come and join us. Help us to do that. The work has only just begun. Thank you.